Thank you very much and good morning everybody. Uh, I thank the organizers to allow me to be a part of this fantastic training program. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. First, uh, uh, if you look at the micro diagnostic microbiology setup, antibiotic susceptibility testing is probably the most valuable interface between a clinical microbiologist and the clinician who is actually treating the patients in an infection. Uh, I was attending a session in Mumbai where uh, somebody asked me, told me uh, uh, at the end of it that you know that we don't bother whether you have grown a termite or an elephant as long as you tell me that you have grown something and you tell me what drug I can use to kill it. <laughs> so so that, is, that is the situation. And uh, looking at the antibiotic susceptibility tests, uh, from the days of dinosaurs, we have come to rocket age, and we have uh, lots of rapid molecular-based uh, antibiotic susceptibility platforms coming up. But in spite of that, the CLSI disc diffusion test has its own unique importance in susceptibility testing because of two reasons. Number one, it's the bread and butter of most of the labs who are actually carrying out susceptibility even now. Secondly, internationally, this is the international reference method for, for evaluating any other uh, uh, coming up newer platforms. And to tell you, truly speaking, CLSI method is not a very easy thing. It has lots of confounders and lots of places where things can go wrong. And uh, uh, we in PGI, we have shifted over to CLSI from our old uh, modified Stokes method pretty late, somewhere in the mid-90s. And we were always being criticized by many people who used to come as examiners. Oh, you are still doing Stokes method. We have uh, shifted over to CLSI long back. I asked them that how you are actually solving this problem, how you are solving this problem, how do you ensure proper uh, thickness of all the plates that you use. Now, one of them said that you know that an experienced technician can compensate for all those things with his own, uh, I mean, own interpret, own way of interpretation. That's not the way CLSI is to be done. So it has lots of intricacies. And today we are going to talk about those intricacies one by one. I congratulate Dr. Deepa Shri because she has gone into uh, a lot of details and put in a lot of hard labor in uh, going through the CLSI document. Probably she has gone through it in more details than any of us we are sitting here. So... <laughs> Uh, she is going to conduct it, and uh, at places, I uh, will be trying to put my views, and all of you are here, and many of you have a lot of experience in carrying out such things, and you can also chip in and give your valuable opinion to make it a fruitful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such uh, insightful introduction. So the session, the session will be a long, around two and a half to three hour session. We'll discuss this in the following headings. First, we'll go into the basics of antimicrobial susceptibility testing, then various testing and reporting groups as described in CLSI and UCAS guidelines, AST interpretive categories, again as described in CLSI and UCAS, organism specific discussion, important ones are discussed here, intrinsic resistance, a very brief note on how to construct a hospital antibiogram, basics of direct susceptibility testing from blood culture broth, major difference between CLSI and UCAST, and also how to send what should an ideal culture, or culture and AST report look like. In these headings, we'll go around the session, and this session will be mainly MCQ-based uh, MCQ session. All of you, please keep your clickers ready. Based on the MCQ, we'll have a brief discussion and move on to the next question. So we'll start, uh, so this, uh, also the similar differences of UCAS will be highlighted wherever necessary in the discussion. 
So first we'll start with the question. Please answer this. This is regarding the importance of cation adjusted Muller internagar, which is used routinely for distribution technique. So e effect of excess divalent cation in MHA results in which of the following? Okay, so 70 of you have responded. It is the calcium ion has a very important action on the daptomycin. Here it decreases the zone size. So coming to the explanation here, for daptomycin, excess calcium content in the muller internagar increases the zone size, whereas reduced calcium content decreases the zone size. This is the importance of calcium ion adjustment in the muller internagar Even for aminoglycosides and tetracycline in Pseudomonas, this is important. Excess calcium and magnesium reduces, reduces the zone size and low cation content may result in unacceptable larger zone size. For carbapenem, zinc plays a very important role. Excess zinc reduces the zone diameters of carbapenem disc. So this has to be taken care when, uh, when we are using muller agar. So next so next, a uh, brief note on how to go about, uh, how many number of disc has to be put on, uh, put on the muller internagar while doing the disc diffusion technique. So in a, uh, in a routine, non-fastidious organism, 12 discs is the maximum disc to be put on 150 mm uh, plate and 6 discs on a 100 mm muller internagar plate. If you are doing sensitivity for streptococci because you expect larger zone size, maximum, uh, maximum of 9 discs uh, can be put on 150 mm and 4 discs on a 100 mm zone, uh, 100 mm Muller, interna Muller internagar containing blood. And zone of hemolysis to be ignored while taking the reading. And this should be placed no less than 24 mm, center to center, no less than 24 mm distance has to be maintained. Then hold the petri plate few inches apart above a black, bra uh, uh, black background with a reflected light. This is a general note we see in CLSI guideline, but there is exception where, are, uh, where, uh, where in few situations illuminated, li uh, illuminated light is used. So this is the, uh, these are the examples where transmitted light is used and not the reflected light is uh, employed. In general, most of the places it is what? It is a reflected light which is used for taking reading, except for these situations where we use transmitted light. Linozolid, when you are taking reading of linozolid in Staph aureus, when we are taking reading of penicillin zone nets test, mupirocin distribution for Staph aureus, Vancomycin screen agar in Staph aureus and while taking vancomycin, this zone's uh, diameter reading in enterococci. All these conditions, we use transmitted light. We should use transmitted light, not the reflected light. Can I make a comment here? Uh, two, two things I'd like to say. Number one is, in case of susceptibility testing, the only thing that matters to us is growth or no growth. Any other kinds of phenotypic expression of the organism is to be ignored. Whether it is hemolysis, whether it is swarming, so all these things, they are of no value to us. Growth and growth, nothing but growth. That is, that is what is important for us. And the standard recommendation is you should look, it with un, look at the plate with unaided eye in reflected light, not in transmitted light or with lenses, except for situations where the resistant phenotype organisms are known to be slow growing. Otherwise, in all other situations, we do not be over, we should not be over enthusiastic and try to make it more sensitive, thereby we will probably uh, misinterpret uh, uh, the results. So next is about the duration of incubation. Most of the cultures before taking the reading, what is the duration of incubation? It is 16 to 18 hours. There are certain conditions for AST where the 20, full 24 hours incubation is mandatory. Can any of you point out a few examples? 
yeah, vancomycin for enterococci. There are other examples when you're reading, when you're taking reading of cefoxetin distribution for coagulase negative staphylococci, the duration of incubation has to be full 24 hours. Vanco screen for staph aureus and enterococcus. Vancomycin MIC for staph aureus and enterococcus. Vancomycin distribution for enterococcus, oxacillin MIC for staph aureus, mupirocin for staph aureus, high level gentamicin or streptomycin MIC, either agar or broad dilution you are doing, full 24 hours incubation has to be done. In cystic fibrosis patient, uh, when you have a pseudomonas aeruginosa grown, again the reading, the AST plate has to be incubated for full 24 hours. For cefoxetin for staph aureus, Lugdin ensues 16 to 18 hours incubation is good enough and HLG and HLS distribution 16 to 18 hours is good enough. Uh, there is also a note telling that at 16 to 18 hours, if the patient, the, if they want the AST report immediately, at 16 to 18 hours, you find it resistant, you can still inform the clinicians. Whereas if it is in the sensitive range, full 24 hours has to be incubated for all these conditions. Okay. Next is there is also a mention of this that is 20 to 24 hours incubation is recommended in certain conditions that is in Acinetobacter species when we are taking uh, when we are reporting Burkholderia sepatia complex, Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, fastidious organisms that is Streptococcus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria gonorrhoeae. All these places they, they mention that the incubation has to be for 20 to 24 hours. Exception in this list of fastidious organism is Haemophilus influenzae, otherwise for all other organisms the duration of incubation has to be 20 to 24 hours. Next coming to the question, please answer this question. This is about how do we go about reading the AST plate. Brief note has already been described by sir, please answer this question. These are mainly learning based questions, that's why options are very big, otherwise uh, it would have been, we could have made it short, but all these gives a lot of information, that's why these are three line uh, sentences. Sixty plus responses are there, shall we see what is the answer? So most of you have given it correctly, can you can go through the other options. The zone margin should be considered as the area showing no obvious visible growth that can be detected with the unaided eye. Okay, then ignore, this is not do not ignore, ignore the faint growth of tiny colonies that can be detected with the help of magnifying lens. With proteus species, a thin veil of swarming can be ignored and with cotrimoxazole, 20 percent or less growth is there that can be ignored. So coming to the general rules of how to measure the zone size, this point has been told. So area with no obvious visible growth with an unaided eye is recorded. Ignore the tiny colonies with the help of which we see with the help of magnifying lens. If visible colony is grown, you can go for repeat AST. Next day you look, you can look whether it is a contaminant or if it is the same pathogen. If it is the same pathogen, colony free inner zone is recorded. So you can see in this picture, this picture shows cotrimoxazole, this is a uh, cotrimoxazole disc where you can see the 20 percent or less growth, the picture A, B, C, it is given that this is 20 percent or less growth, so these are taken as sensitive and the last picture alone is taken as resistant. Okay, this is the meaning, so slight growth that is less than 20 percent of lawn culture growth near the margin should be disregarded and more obvious margin should be recorded. This note has been given for Enterobacteriaceae, Acinetobacter, Burkholderia, Stenotrophomonas, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus and Neisseria meningitidis. Is this clear for all of you? So for cotrimoxazole disc, if it is 20 percent or less growth, that has to be ignored and more clear margin has to be recorded. 
So please answer this question, which of the following is considered as resistant when you are taking reading for phosphomycin in E. coli? There are four pictures, A, B, C, D, which of this you think is resistant? Yeah. Are you able to view uh, which is A, which is B, C in to the last This row? is A, B, C and D. Okay. 70 plus responses are there. So what is the answer here? It is only D. This has been mentioned in phosphomycin. In phosphomycin, ignore isolated colonies within the inhibition zone. Okay, this is the picture where A, B, C you consider as sensitive. You can see here, ignore all colonies and read the outer zone edge. This has been mentioned for phosphomycin when you are taking reading of phosphomycin for E. coli. Only the last yeah. one yeah. is considered. Yes. Yeah. That is the previous one. You see, normally for most of the drug bug combinations, we get a sharp line of demarcation at the border of the zone of inhibition. There are a few exceptional situations where we can get a, a border which deviates from it. One of them is sometimes you can get a heaping up at the border which is indirect proof of beta lactamase production at a particular threshold concentration of the drug. That is one issue. Another issue is sometimes you get a trailing growth so that you cannot easily make out that, I mean between 100% growth and no growth, the, the, the difference is about two, three, four millimeters. So in that situation, it confuses up where exactly we should measure. So for cotrimoxazole, it has been clearly said that you take the junction, taking 100% at one end and 0% at another end, you take at the 20% border as the point for measurement. So 80% growth should be accepted, 20% growth as compared to the 100% outside, that should be ignored. So this holds true for the list of organisms she has shown for cotrimoxazole. No. Uh, this, there, there are many things uh, which uh, do not have very clear-cut explanations why organisms they behave like this in certain antibiotics. So this is a phenomenon where in, in sulfonamide group of drugs, people, they have found that this type of trailing zone border we see. And they have tried to correlate clinically with the level of antibiotics achieved and the outcome. And they have found that if we take the zone at the 20% uh, uh, margin, then it correlates best with the outcome of treatment, therapeutic outcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for the explanation. Actually, you know that uh, how these breakpoints and these zone sizes, they are arrived at, it's a very complex interplay of many, many confounding factors. Thankfully, organizations like UCAST and CLSI, they have been doing it for us. So that, I mean, you know that if we can easily drive a car without knowing how it is work, uh, actually running, we can use a computer without knowing how it is functioning. <laughs> so if we go delve into those things, it becomes much more complicated. For example, uh, how many times am I see a very valid question he has asked, should be achieved to kill the organism? Will depend on what is the half-life of the drug? will depend also on that, uh, uh, what is the frequency at which we are administering it. For example, if the frequency is eight hourly and we have a half-life of two hours, and if we are using an antibiotic which is time dependent and we want to achieve at least 40% or 50% of the time it should be above MIC, so we need a complex calculation how many fold MIC should be achieved so that after every half-life it comes down, and be before the next dose, between the gap, what percentage of the time period actually it is above the MIC, depending on whether it's a time-dependent drug or a concentration-dependent drug. So, I mean, uh, and also depends on the site of infection, how much, yeah.
So this is this was about uh, phosphomycin reading in E. coli, where the last one is considered resistant. The first three you take it as sensitive because ignore all colonies inside the outer zone niche. This is for pro this picture shows about proteus swarming to ignore the thin veil of growth. So first and second you just ignore the proteus swarming. Here third one you consider the most more obvious zone of inhibition. Next picture this is about the penicillin zone niche test. This shows the clearly cliff effect. Here it is fuzzy or beach effect. This picture shows about penicillin zone edge test. So uh, I think most of you are clear with this. What does it indicate if there is a cliff effect? Yeah, it is resistant. Here if it is beach effect, sensitive. Next is uh, vancomycin distribution for enterococci. Here you can see the first sec there are four pictures. The first, second and third, the first one you can see a very sharp zone, second, third and fourth it is more of a fuzzy zone edge. So here it is told that when it is fuzzy zone edge or colonies are seen within the zone, you, it is better to perform an alternative method and then issue the report. Here it is given 12 mm because it, in UCAS guidelines it is more than or equal to 12 is um, 12 is resist uh, more than or equal to 12 is sensitive according to CLSI 17. But the similar principle can also be applied for CLSI guideline. Whenever there is a clear zone edge, we can take the reading and if it is more than the clinical breakpoint of sensitive, report it as sensitive. If there is more fuzzy edge or the colonies are seen inside, better to do repeat the test or do a alternate test. Uh, can you show the previous? Yeah. In the fourth figure here that's, that's being shown, the first thing you should first decide is are you dealing with a pure organism here? It's quite possible that you have put in, put in a mixture and the zone is actually valid. A second organism is growing inside with a different, different zone. So, I mean, always be sure in such situations that you are dealing with a pure culture. Next, coming to the test and reporting groups. So there are various, this concept of selective and cascade reporting has been mentioned in CLSI. So what is this? This is a practice where uh, every institution has a set of group A, group B and uh, group C antibiotics. You test uh, group A, group B antibiotics on the first day and you choose to report the selective antibiotics depending upon the antibiotic panel. So here the concept of cascade reporting is refers to a practice of reporting AST result for the limited number of antibiotic instead of reporting all the tested antibiotic. So each laboratory should decide how to go about what are the d uh, groups the actual group CLSI gr gives the group A, group B and group C but it has to be done according to the local antibiogram. So the, this is what is the definition given in CLSI. Group A is a primary testing group of antibiotic and this has to be reported on day one. Group B is tested on day one but reported selectively. Group C are supplemental and selectively reported. Group U are only for urinary isolate. Group INV is also mentioned that is these are the drug which is not approved by FDA and there are also other which are clinically indicated but not tested. These are the groups mentioned in CLSI. So when do we report group B drugs? So what is tested on first day is group A and group B. Group A has to be reported on first day. When do you choose, the rep when, when do you choose to report group B? In these circumstances, that is when you find the primary antibiotics, that is group A antibiotics are resistant or the patient is allergic or intolerant to group A set of antibiotics or in certain condition, whether it is a, if it is a polymicrobial infection, infection involving multiple sites or for infection control purposes or third generation cephalosporin for enteric bacilli for CSF because your clinician wants that or it is a most chosen drug by the clinician. So you choose to report these drugs. Okay, group A drug has to be reported on day one, group B has to be reported in all these conditions. These are the indications for reporting group B set of antibiotics. Next is group U, few examples. As used, this is only used for treating urinary tract infection. Example is nitrofurantoin and certain quinolones like norfloxacin. Exception here is cefazolin is listed as a surrogate agent, surrogate marker for all oral cephalosporin used to treat uncomplicated UTI. 
Okay. This other antimicrobial agent with broader indication may be included in group U. Example is ciprofloxacin and enterococci. Ciprofloxacin is used to treat only enterococci. Uh, for enterococcus, ciprofloxacin is test tested for urinary isolate. This is example for group U set of antibiotics. This is how the CLSA chart looks like for it, it, it is there for it is there for many this is there for Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Burkholderia, Cenotroph. Likewise, most of the organism it is mentioned. It will mention group A, B, C and also group U set of antibiotics. But the similar replica need not be employed. It has to be designed based on the uh, clinician's choice of uh, uh, clinician choice of use on patients. Next is coming to a simple example why the breakpoints are very important and it's why is it important to know. Can I make a comment here? Uh, you must be very clear about two things here. One is cascade reporting, one is cascade testing. Uh, I mean the group B is actually cascade reporting but has been tested in the first go on the day one. And when a word of caution, we will come to hospital antibiogram when we carry out a cascade testing, then the, I mean, the antibiotics which are tested later on, uh, when we prepare an antibiogram, we have to be very uh, clear in our mind that there is a bias in that because we are testing only organisms which have already been proven to be resistant to the first line of A or B drugs. And therefore, there can be a higher representation of resistance in those organisms. Had we subjected all the isolates on the first go only, then the group C antibiotic susceptibility results would have gone slightly higher as compared to when we test only the, the I mean, registered uh, uh, bad guys to those antibiotics. So, uh, what is a break? Is it different when you report this Pseudomonas species that is other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Putida group or fluorescence group or Stadzeri group? Is it same breakpoint or is it different? So, how many of you report this diffusion for other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa? Are there this diffusion breakpoints available for other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa? This diffusion breakpoints are Tell not honestly, available. Honestly, how many of you report? So you can see this in, in um, CLSI, this group is given as non-entrobacteriaceae that is other than, other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetobacter, Burkholderia sepaceus, Stenotrophomonas maltophila, rest all comes under this non-entrobacteriaceae family and most of it does not have the distribution breakpoints. Only MIC breakpoints are available. So in such cases, better to report as identification as what? One of the Pseudomonas species or what you have identified. And AST report cannot be performed. If you don't have MIC facility, AST report cannot be performed because clinical breakpoints are not available. Okay, because it is being done in a methodical way, we can't just extrapolate randomly. You cannot choose to report putida with the help of aeruginosa group. This will add up to the wrong, wrong, the, the data will become wrong. So, it is important to give that note if you are, if the distribution breakpoints are not available. So this is for uh, this is how it is given for staph entero beta hemolytic streptococci streptococcus pneumoniae and viridens. These are the group A, B, and C group of antibiotics. Next. So all these are there in CLSI. So I mean, uh, we have we have, we have just summarized everything into. This is the same table which is available in CLSI. Next, coming to various AST interpretive categories. So what is this AST interpretive categories? What are clinical breakpoints? These are based on in vitro response of an uh, organism to an antimicrobial agent at a level corresponding to 
serum levels attainable with usually prescribed dosage for that particular agent. Already sir has explained about that. This is how the clinical breakpoint is arrived at. A the large number of isolates are taken and this issue, this all these factors are analyzed. This is derived from microbiological characteristic, PKPD parameters are considered and also based on what dosing is given that is also taken into account while arriving at clinical breakpoints. So, can answer this question please. The following are CLSI interpretive category for clinical reporting on MIC or zone diameter except which of these? Sixty plus responses are there. So, ep most of you have answered correct. Epidemiological cutoff value should not be interpreted for clinical breakpoint purpose. It is only for epidemiological study. We record it as wild type and non wild type. This, these breakpoints should not be used for clinical reporting. Uh, answer this question please. This is regarding the SDD that is susceptible dose dependent concept. If the MIC is in SDD range, it indicates all of the following except which one. It does not account for, that concept is not being mentioned. It, it, this SDD concept indicates higher doses may be required, more frequent doses may be required, also alternative dosing options should be sorted out. One second, anybody ask something? I will yeah. explain about... I will explain you, sir. There is a slide on SDD, I will come to it. Before that, please answer this question. According to 2019 CLSI, which of these does not have the STD breakpoints? 2018, it was given for very few. There are few additions in CLSI 2019. Which of this is a wrong option? So the, this will tell you that uh, whether you have downloaded <laughs> or you have opened also. It is available for the other three. Very I'll good. show you the chart. So first, let us see what is STD, and then I'll show you a table, concise table of where all STD is available. So what is this susceptible dose dependent? Is it same as in, uh, intermediate category, or is it different, or is it under intermediate category? It is a type of intermediate. We, so there, there was three categories: sensitive, intermediate, resistant. Under intermediate, CLSI has further added a terminology that is susceptible dose dependent, where it is clear that at that if you increase the dose, clinical outcome is recorded or it is proven that with increase in dose, there is clinical outcome recorded. What is, inter what is, the, meaning, what is the meaning of intermediate? There are different, uh, it gives a multiple options. So intermediate can be what all? You can use higher dose. If the patient, if the renal parameters or if the uh, vital support or if there is, uh, if the organ dysfunction is not there, wherever applicable higher doses can be used. Second, second option is it can act as a buffer zone. Third option is they can, it can also account for certain technical variation which can occur when we do distribution technique. These are all the interpretations. Uh, we should derive whenever we record intermediate category. It is always not that you just can increase the dose and you can treat the patient. It is not a single option terminology. There are multiple options. Whereas STD, it is it gives a better, uh, it, it gives a more clear picture that if a dose, if dose is increased, there is clinical outcome can be expected. 
So what is this? I uh, will just go through this. Isolate with MIC or zone diameter in SDD range implies that it is necessary to use a dosing regimen that is higher dose, more frequent dose or both that results in high drug exposure than the normal dose that was used to establish the susceptible breakpoint. Higher exposure gives a higher probability of adequate coverage of a SDD isolate. However, higher dosage must be clinically approved and adjusted for a organ function. This is, this should be kept in mind. So these are the conditions where SGD is available in CLSI 2019. One is cefepime for enterobacteriaceae, ceftarolin for staph aureus, daptomycin for enterococcus. I will just explain one example that is cefepime for enterobacteriaceae. Can you see this? Susceptible is MIC is less than or equal to 2. A susceptible dose dependent is given as 4 to 8, okay, 4 to 8 is susceptible dose dependent, anything more than 8 is resistant. So if it is less than or equal to 2, at, at what constant, at what, uh, at what uh, the yes. dose is it arrived at, less than or equal to 2 is arrived at a dose of 1 gram at 12 hourly. If, if, if it is sensitive range, this is the dose recommended. Say suppose it is 4 microgram per liter, the dosage advised is 1 gram every 8 hour or 2 gram every 12 hourly can be given. If the, if the MIC is 8 microgram, 2 gram at 8 hourly is recommended. Okay, this is with the dosage, the, the breakpoints, MIC breakpoints along with the doses has been clearly mentioned and with this doses, if uh, there are, with these recommended doses, the clinical outcome, the, there is more probability of good clinical outcome. If it is more than 8, it is taken as resistant. There is also an addition, additional point mentioned that is, say suppose you are not doing MIC, you have a, you are doing only disc diffusion and SDD distribution is 19 to 24 mm. Then how do we know whether it is this, we should go to this dosage or this dosage? It is clearly mentioned that zone diameter, you cannot tell that the first 4 millimeter, I will take it as 4 microgram. There is, it is not corresponding. The rule here is you just take it as 8, mi whatever the dose to be given for 8 microgram per ml, you just have to consider that for disc diffusion SDD range. Are you all clear with this or should I repeat? Repeat, repeat, uh, repeat. This, the last point is the zone diameter uh, explanation, yes. So if say suppose we are not doing MIC, we are doing disc diffusion and cefepime gives a zone of say suppose 21 mm. Then what are we going to do? We cannot divide like first 4 mm I am going to consider as 4 microgram, next 4 mm 8 mic. That cannot be done because you cannot, th those are not parallel. If you have a zone diameter between 19 and 24 in the STD range, you just consider the dosage which is given for higher, higher MIC value. Here MIC is 4 to 8, you just consider as 8. Whatever dose to be given for 8, that dose is what, that dose should be added in the comment. Now is it clear? Yes. So, okay. so, uh, so this information uh, should be a part of your reporting. If you are, if you are reporting SDD, then uh, you have to write a bottom line that this is the recommended dose for uh, 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 what has to be given. I think for cefepime, people who are doing Vitec also, you can see SDD dose will come. So along with that Vitec report, it is better to add the comment telling that if it is 8, what is the dose recommended? If it is 4, what is the dose recommended? So basically it is correlating with the clinical response. Yes, sir. This is, so that is what... So done some kind of study in which yeah. they have said a cohort of patients with the MIPs of so and so birth, they have given dose at this and there is a clinical response. So they have defined for that. Yes, sir. But for other bugs exactly i was going to ask the same question so then what is the ex i mean actually precisely what is the dif difference between i and sdd in i we have non predictability in sdd with the usual dosage we have un un unpredictability but we have a predictable response with either higher dosage or more frequent dosage, or at a particular site where the antibiotic might get concentrated. So that has been proven with, uh, uh, by experiment, by studies, it has been proven. In others, it's a possibility that it might respond, but still, we have not yet proven it. 
uh, and secondly, the difference between the MIC values and the zone diameter values, the precision with which we can uh, predict the dosage in case of MIC values, that precision does not apply to zone diameter studies. As it is, the, the distance from the disk center uh, and the concentration achieved is not a linear function, it's a second degree function. I mean, it falls uh, with the square of the distance from the center, and that also doesn't follow uh, uh, in a very reliable way as the distance goes, goes increasing. So we cannot really uh, interpret the same way as we can interpret with, with the MIC tests. So what I think uh, most of you heard about this ATC-DDD thing. I'm going to explain that, sir. Right. Yeah, 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 I have included that. Yeah. Okay. So next coming to, uh, about non, the term called non-susceptible. What do you understand by the term non-susceptible? Please answer this question. Okay, 60 plus responses are there. So, okay, there's a confusion between A and C option. So, what do you understand by the term non-susceptible? These are used for isolates where only susceptible breakpoints are defined. There is no breakpoints defined for I or R. There are, I'll show you the chart where only S is defined. There is not, there is no I or R defined. What is not susceptible? Anything, if there is I and R, other than sensitive, both are not susceptible. That is the difference between non-susceptible and not susceptible. I'll show you the chart. Second uh, option is an isolate that is interpreted as non-susceptible does not mean that the resistant mechanism does not exist. And for strain yielding results suggestive of a non-susceptible category, organism identification and AST report should be confirmed. So this is the table. This, uh, this is a compiled version from the CLSI document that where only S only sensitive range is defined whereas I and R are not defined. This, this is what is the meaning of non-susceptibility where only sensitive breakpoints are defined. There is no intermediate or resistant breakpoint defined. So in this condition, what is it? If you get anything other than that, you have to re-identify the organism, repeat testing. If you still get the same report, you have to send it to a reference center. Okay. So what is this? Isolate for which susceptible breakpoint is designated because of uh, uh, it because there is very rare occurrence or absence of resistance mechanism. MIC or zone diameter below the susceptible breakpoint are recorded as non-susceptible. So non-susceptible does not necessarily mean that uh, the isolate has a resistance mechanism and this should not be considered uh, confused with non-susceptible. I plus R whenever it is defined that is not susceptible when there is no definition for intermediate or resistant that is non-susceptible. Yeah. Can you see this table? Is it visible? See the, the, for example daptomycin in staphylococcus. In MIC, only sensitive breakpoint is defined. You just see the intermediate resistance, it gives dash. There is no breakpoint defined at all. So anything more than this you get, you have to record it as not intermediate or resistant. You are going to record as non-susceptible. In such condition, you have to re-identify the organism and repeat testing. Why is this? Because resistance mechanism is ex almost absent or extremely rare. That is why repeat testing is recommended. Still you get the same result, you have to refer it to a reference center. That is the meaning of non-susceptible. Is it clear now? So truly speaking, uh, not susceptible is what it literally means. But non-susceptible has been updated to a kind of a proper noun status right now. So it's a defined, defined terminology. 
So don't use non-susceptible casually, but you can use not susceptible in a casual way. <laughs> so again, these are the categories. beta hemolytic streptococci, there are many drugs where there is only sensitive breakpoint defined. For such drugs, you have to report it as non-susceptible. Okay? There is a long list. Uh, she has compiled everything into a table. So, uh, answer this question. This is, uh, uh, this is regarding the UCAS guidelines. Which of the following interpretive category does n is not there in UCAS 2019? So, till now we have discussed the interpretive uh, category of CLSI. Now, we will discuss uh, uh, what is the difference in UCAS. Okay. So, what is it? It is intermediate. <laughs> their I is there, but it is not intermediate. I'm going to explain that. So this also please answer so that I explanation I'll give together. The following is the expansion of I according to 2019 UCAST. Which of the following is the exp expansion of I? I is not intermediate that we have seen in the previous slide. So what is it? So if you press, int if you press A, uh, that means you have uh, you have not listened the previous course. <laughs> So it is susceptible increased exposure. I'm going to explain that. So these are the terminologies used in UCAS guideline. Isolate is susceptible. You tell it as S or I. Under that, there are two things. One is susceptible at standard dosing or susceptible at increased dosing. If it is susceptible at standard dosing, then you term it as S. Susceptible at increased dosage, then you term it as I. If the isolate is resistant, then it is R. There is also a column available that is called as ATU, that is area of technical uncertainty. Next slide, I'll tell you what is that. But to just familiarize with this term, what is used in UCAS 2019, S includes S and I. S for susceptible with standard dosing. I is for susceptible with increased dosing. R is for resistant. And also there is term ATU. So what is this ATU? ATU is there were they saw that there is lot of, it, for a few for few drug bug combination there was lot of uncertainty. They don't know how to interpret those reports. So for such a drug bug combination, they have expressed this area of technical uncertainty. These are situation where laboratories must take certain actions if these zone diameters are achieved. So for these drugs. The, CLA, the UCAS 2019 gives the ATU for these drug bug combination. This is the entire list. So how is it given? Uh, I'll just show you how is it given. So this is how the UCAS first page looks like. Okay. So you can see this S, R and ATU. There is a column added ATU. Not all drug bug combination ATU is expressed for very few. What I just showed in the previous slide that uh, ATU is mentioned. You can see here S, R and ATU. I would, I would also like to add one more point. This I category, what I told, they have not made it into a separate column. They have told that anything in between S and R, you just interpret as I. That is susceptible increased exposure. If it is complete overlap, then you just take it as no I exist. So can you see this first example? 2020 is there. So more than more than or equal to 20 is sensitive, less than 20 is resistant. So it is overlapping. There is no I category at all. Next example, can you see? There is 26 and 23. So anything more than or equal to 26 is sensitive, less than 23 is resistant. In between, that is 24 to 24 and 25, you just take it as I. There is no separate mention of susceptible increased exposure. Is this point clear? Okay. So there are few drugs for which ATU is mentioned. So can you see here? This is for Pseudomonas aeruginosa for piperacillin tezobactam. ATU is mentioned. There is a small like one or two. Uh, the, this is the breakpoint 18 to 19. So in such condition, how do we go about the how, what is the troubleshooting we do? So if you have this ATU in the laboratory, following should be done. You repeat the test. If there is a reason to suspect a technical error, 
or you perform an alternate test, any phenotypic or genotypic alternate test, report the result as, uh, the, the ATU result should be reported in the clinical report as uncertain. Downgrade the susceptibility report. Report as R if several good alternative AST report is available and also discuss this particular issue with the clinician because for you to repeat the test you need some time, right? So you discuss this issue with the clinician. So for all these drugs they have described the term ATU. They have also uh, told that this is a new concept they are bringing about. If this works out and if this, this gives a better clinical outcome, they are going to extend this for many other other drug bug combinations. One second. Uh, so remember ATAU is actually something for the consumption of the microbiologist, not for the clinicians. It can have multiple uh, reasons behind it. So that's to, to uh, exclude one by one the, the uh, steps she has already shown that you repeat the test, it may be resolved. Uh, finally, if it cannot be resolved, then to the clinician we Tell them only that this is uncertain, but we don't call it ATU because clinician doesn't know how to interpret it. Truly speaking, ATU has three things incorporated into it, the drug, the bug, and the concentration range. Uh, it's possible that higher than this concentration and lower than that range, it gives you consistent results. But only in that window, it doesn't get, give consistent result and it doesn't correlate with outcome. Next, coming to epidemiological cutoff value. So, what are these? In CLSI, you see it is given as ECOF. In UCAS, they mention it as ECV. So, what is, the, what is this? It's an MIC or zone diameter value that separates microbial population with or without phenotypically detectable resistance. So, we call it as wild type and non-wild type isolates. So, wild type is where there is no detectable resistance, whereas non-wild type describe isolate with detectable resistance and reduce susceptibility to drugs.
this is what is the definition of wild type and non wild type wild type is isolates with no detectable resistance non wild type are isolates with detectable resistance and reduce susceptibility okay this is what this is how the ecof is categorized into wild type and non wild type so uh, ecv is uh, is based on the uh, mic or zone diameter distribution these should not be reported as si or r and they should not be used as a clinical breakpoints because the clinical relevance or the outcome uh, or patient outcome based on these breakpoints is not studied so this should not be used for clinical interpretation this is where this is how the ECO, this are the list this is a list of ecof given in clsi for azithromycin colistin and vancomycin azithromycin for shigella flexneri and sony colistin for all these organism and vancomycin it is given for uh, for anaerobic organisms this is the list of ecof next coming to a concept of equivalent agent okay so what is this equivalent agent so please answer this according to 2019 clsi which of these combinations cannot be taken as equivalent agents So what is the answer here? It is C. It is not ceftazidim. It is cefotaxim. Ceftriaxone and cefotaxim. That is there even in the previous year CLSI. The new addition is colistin and polymyxin B can be extrapolated. That is, these are equivalent agents. So what are these equivalent agents? Test performed with an agent predict results of closely related agent of the same class this is what is the definition of equivalent agent this indicates cross susceptibility and cross resistance and it is nearly complete there is acceptable uh, very uh, there is acceptable uh, error that is very major and major error is less than 3% and minor error is less than 10% and the good thing is only one agent needs to be tested this is the advantage of using equivalent agent this is the list given in clsi S Yes, the epidemiology of cutoffs are for the uh, for the uh, wild strains which have never been exposed to any antibiotics before. There is no registered known resistance mechanism. So my question is, what is the source of these strains? Well, uh, mm, this is this is this is a very common concept that people try to explain them wild type as which has not been exposed to antibiotics. I don't think that is true. Antibiotics are there everywhere in the environment. And since the time organisms have been there, they have been producing antibiotics. That's not truly. So they do not have a known detectable mechanism of resistance for that antibiotic. Truly speaking, even if we talk about, anti which, I mean, those which have not been exposed to antibiotics and those which have been exposed to antibiotics, does exposure cause resistance? It selects out resistant ones. It doesn't cause resistance. We do not have, there, there is some amount of evidence coming up that they, they can be responsible for uh, how to hypermutable states in some organisms. But truly speaking, resistance was there in the, in, in the intestinal flora of Egyptian mummies. So when no antibiotic, I mean, extraneous antibiotic exposure was not there. So truly speaking, wild strains are those which do not have any detectable mechanism of resistance and non-wild strains have a mechanism of resistance. Okay. So this is a list of equivalent agents give mentioned in CLSI. Ceftriaxone and cefotaxim for enterobacteriaceae, azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin for staphylococcus species, penicillin susceptible staphylococci, this we all know, we use for staphylococcus, the results of ampicillin uh, susceptibility test used to predict amoxicillin in haemophilus species and for anaerobes also, ampicillin susceptibility can be used to uh, predict sensitivity to amoxicillin. So these are the list of equivalent agents. So, sir, uh, I have one thing to ask you. So, if we if we report for uh, one antibiotic, if it is equivalent to uh, or to many other 
antibiotic is it should be a part of the reporting also that if you are reporting uh, for example aseftriaxin uh, aseftriaxin if you are reporting then we should write a comment that uh, aseftriaxin uh, susceptibility uh, should be taken truly speaking uh, you are very right because many of the clinicians may not have this knowledge yeah. in both equivalent agents and surrogate agents uh, yeah. it's very frequent that your clinician will say that I don't know what are antibiotics you taste for staph or yes. You taste for antibiotics which you don't use, and those which we use, cefotaxime, carbapenems, you don't taste for. Uh, that is because they don't know that cefoxitin susceptibility is the surrogate agent for all beta lactams and BLBLI combinations. So it's better to write it down for the benefit of the so clinicians. All the surrogate uh, agents and uh, all, the, all the equivalent agents it is better to write the uh, uh, sentence uh, behind it, okay? Next, coming to surrogate. So, which of the following is not a surrogate marker? Answer this question using clicker. So what is the answer here? It is C. So why is it so? Tetracycline sensitive. It is sensitive to doxycycline and minocycline. If tetracycline is intermediate or resistant, it can still be sensitive to doxycycline, minocycline or both. You cannot take it as a surrogate agent. So what is surrogate agent? Test performed with this agent replaces the test performed with the antimicrobial agent of interest. Either ways, when it is sensitive or resistant or uh, the interpretation should be just extrapolated. You need not test the agent of interest again. This is what is the definition for surrogate agent. So this is the list of surrogate agents. So first one is, we have already discussed in the previous slide, that is cefazolin is a surrogate agent for Surrogate agent for treating uncomplicated urinary tract infection in Enterobacteriaceae. Cefoxetin is a surrogate agent for uh, predicting beta-lactam resistance in Staph aureus, Lugdinensis, Epidermidis. Then Oxacillin in Streptococcus pneumoniae, Pfloxacin in Salmonella, Cholestin in Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas serigenosa and Acinetobacter baumani complex. So these, this is a list of surrogate agents means what? What is the difference between equivalent agent and surrogate agent? 
So what difference, is the difference? Difference between equivalent agent and surrogate agent. Can anyone explain? Please your uh, mic, ma'am. Uh, no, we're, we're not audible. No, cefraxin and cefotaxim, if it is a equivalent agent, it means what? It's, it's very simple. Equivalent agents belong to the same group. Surrogate agents are usually of a different group. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, she will come to that. The, the, there is yeah. a lot of we complication have in, in the Staphylococcus group and anti staphylococcal agents. I mean, each uh, species of organism behaves in its own characteristic way. But I want to point out to, to one thing here as a generalization. There are certain groups of antibiotics where the individual members show a predictable hierarchy. For example, the tetracycline group. We have tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline, tigacycline. So if an organism is sensitive to one of the lower groups, it's expected to be sensitive to all the higher groups. Uh, uh, similarly, say cephalosporins, uh, uh, generation one, two, three for enterobacteria C. So it shows a hierarchy, but uh, sensitivity to a higher agent doesn't necessarily tell us that it will be sensitive to the, a lower agent. So that's, whereas there are antibiotic groups where each member shows a dissociated behavior, for example, aminoglycosides. It's a totally, it's equally possible that you can have gentamicin sensitive amicacin resistant or gentamicin resistant amicacin sensitive depending on what is the uh, antibiotic modifying enzyme profile of that bug. So though we know that uh, amicacin sensitive gentamicin resistance is far more frequent than gentamicin res uh, sensitive amicacin resistance, but it's possible because of a dissociated resistance. Thank you, sir.
So next coming to site specific reporting of antimicrobial agents. So which of these drugs are not reported for CSF isolates? Answer this using clicker. Which of these drugs are not used for reporting CSF isolates? Do you do a site specific reporting? Uh, or whatever you test, uh, you report everything. Uh, depending on the, uh, upon the sample, uh, whether you uh, do site-specific reporting. Okay. So what is the answer? It is still few of them have answered that. The answer is all of the above. These are the drugs which should not be reported for CSF isolates. That is, administered agents administered only through oral route. First and second generation cephalosporins, encephamycins, clindamycins, macrolides, tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones, carbapenem other than meropenem. These drugs should not be reported for CSF isolates. So which of the following should not be reported for isolates from urinary tract? All, all of the above will not be answered. Answer is all these drugs that is clindamycin, macrolides, chloramphenicol should not be reported for urinary tract isolates. Next question, which of the following should not be reported for respiratory isolates? Very easy question. So, daptomycin is not reported for respiratory isolates. You know why? Inactivated, Inactivated yes. by the surfactant. Okay. So, next coming about organism specific discussion. So, first is Enterobacteriaceae. So, please answer this. Regarding phosphomycin susceptibility test in Enterobacteriaceae, all of the following are true except which of this option? So what is the CLSA approved MIC method? It is agar dilution, not the broth dilution. Other options you can see, so this diffusion breakpoints are available. In CLSA, it's available only for E. coli urinary isolates. This cannot be extrapolated for other isolates of Enterobacteriaceae. This strength is 200 microgram, plus it should also contain 50 microgram of glucose 6-phosphate. So there are few points to be noted. Uh, so, uh, 200, this I have already told, in UCAST guideline that this, uh, the interpretation for phosphomycin is also available for other organisms in Enterobacteriaceae, but distribution breakpoints are not available, only MIC breakpoints are available for isolates other than E. coli in Enterobacteriaceae family. Next, please answer so, this. Sir, uh, I mean, my doubt is, uh, uh, for some particular uh, Example, in, in this case, uh, can we use a UCAS guideline and we can extrapolate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. 
Please answer this question. According to CLSI guideline, the susceptibility breakpoint for meropenem distribution test, which of these options are correct? So, it is yeah, it's very evident that it is different for Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter and Burkholderia sepatia. So, I have made a table here to tell that there is, this is just one example we are giving. So, it is different for, you can see all the three breakpoints, that is sensitive, intermediate, resistant, clinical breakpoints are different for all these organisms. So, what is the message conveyed in this slide? Don't try to remember the zone diameters. Humanly not possible. How many of you just do distribution test and report? Not only distribution or along with Vitec also distributions, sending to the clinicians? Combination, okay. So, how do you go about reading the distribution, uh, uh, the breakpoints? How many of you have automated uh, readers for AST? So, very few. So, how do we go about? So, what is a better method, what is a message conveyed here is, we should be as precise as possible when we are reporting the breakpoints. It is better to have a chart or a poster in front of us and report it very precisely. Because every, uh, every report counts for the patient as well as all of us contribute to the national and global resistance mechanism. So, if over reporting or under reporting will give a wrong message, that is why it is, it is advised to be very, very precise in this reports, report interpretation. Next question, so regarding uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and AMC production, which of the following option is true? This is while reading a AST plate of a clinical isolate. If you see inducible AMC production, then you oh, see yeah. ceftazidim and as a sensitive. How do we go about reporting these in the clinical report? If you don't remember the zone diameter, then this is in the in the sensitive range. This is also in the sensitive range. Only if Do you get AMCs uh, when you uh, report? So, what is the answer here? So, the answer is report ceftazidim and piptaz is sensitive. Why is it so? Anyone would like to add a note on this or want to tell? Why is it so? 18 of you have answered. So, it was just a guess or uh, you know you know the reason. Sir, you want to add something? Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to the this explanation later. So please answer this next question. Routine testing is not necessary for detection of ESBL AMC carbapenemase. This is an assertion. Reason is presence of these enzymes may not be clinically relevant. So which of these options you think are correct? These are assertion and reason type of question. So, what is the answer here? It is A, routine testing 
routine testing is not necessary for all these enzymes because these are more important for epidemiological purpose and infection control purpose this should not be interpreted for clinical reporting why is it so because either clsi or ucas when the breakpoints are designed all these are taken care of you need not add an uh, add an extra test or change your interpretation based on the enzyme detection so this should not be tested routinely should be tested only for epidemiological and infection control purposes so this is again given mentioned clearly in ucas guideline the cephalosporin carbapenemone astreonam breakpoints for enterobacterials will detect all clinically important resistance mechanism including esbl plasmid mediated amc and carbapenemesis so these breakpoints are designed so that clinically relevant resistance mechanism are detected so you need not change your interpretation based on the enzyme detection method what you see on the ast plate some isolates that produce beta lactamases are susceptible to third and fourth generation cephalosporin with these breakpoints and should be reported as tested okay even though this this is just a quote of example even though it is a beta lactamase producer you will not change your interpretation interpretation is as per the breakpoints of sensitive intermediate and resistant so uh, this is a change in clsi 2019 what is a breakpoint for ciprofloxacin for e coli by distribution so please press don't tell This is a surrogate marker of you have downloaded or you have opened <laughs> the CLSI uh, 2019. Whether you have downloaded or you opened and you read also, this question is a surrogate marker. At least changes for some time. We should remember, I think. <laughs> okay. So, what is the answer? this is the change so breakpoints this is a, what is highlighted in red is changed from 2018 to 2019 what is in black is same as per 2018 so for enterobacterial say the sensitive breakpoint now is more than or equal to 26 intermediate is 22 to 25 resistant is less than or equal to 21 and these are the mic breakpoint changes and for pseudomonas it is more than or equal to 25 is sensitive less than or equal to 18 is resistant levofloxacin breakpoints also has been changed for enterobacterial and pseudomonas aeruginosa why is it important to be aware of these changes especially if applied for people who are using vitek only vitek or even for distribution how many of you are uh, are using uh, vitek uh, uh, many of you you know that uh, vitek has not changed uh, 2018 into uh, 2019 uh, uh, when we asked them they told that they will change only in the month of april so sir how to address this this is very well known even in clsi document it's very clearly written that uh, it it's not necessary that they have to overnight change it they will validate in their taking into account the reference method now they will test it they will take 6 months to change over and the 6 month the new guideline will come and then they have been fda approved also so okay it will take almost a year later there is a fresh card come the fda approved card once the break points change so for this can we take just the value the numerical value and interpret as per the new breakpoint so that can be done so if you are aware of what are the changes you just take the breakpoint value alone don't take the interpretation and interpretation can be changed as per the new guidelines till the vitek is updated so uh, every year they tweak some changes maybe uh, some points here and there does it mean that what we previously reported was wrong it is not from uh, from january 1st onwards if you report it is wrong <laughs> <laughs> no no it's it's quite possible that we are we are learning if, uh, as we progress we keep on learning more and more uh, but uh, uh, if you if you have the mic values available you can reinterpret and you can easily uh, i mean update your uh, previous values into the newer criteria
So this is the comparison of 2018 and 19. This is what this was a this was a comparison. This is of 2018 and this is for 2019. This was enterobacteriaceae and pseudomonas. This was already shown in the previous slide. Next is about Salmonella and Shigella. So what is the answer for this? The preferred test for assessing fluoroquinolone susceptibility in Salmonella species, susceptibility or resistance in Salmonella species. Which of these are preferred test? The answer is ciprofloxacin MIC test. If there is one test which you, t which you can rely on, that is ciprofloxacin MIC test. Actually speaking, no single test detects all resistance mechanism for fluoroquinolone in salmonella. There is no single test, but the most preferred test is ciprofloxacin MIC test. In centers where they use levofloxacin or afloxacin, as a clinical choice, then they can do the uh, MIC test of levofloxacin or ofloxacin. If a ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin or efloxacin, oflox or cipro cannot be done in such situation, pefloxacin disdiffusion may be used as a surrogate test to, uh, to predict sensitivity in fluoroquinolones. Okay? There is no like a gold star, like a single test which can detect all the resistance mechanism. The most preferred one is ciprofloxacin MIC test. Okay, in centers where they are using oflox or levoflox, the, the respective MICs should be done by those laboratories. 
Next, please answer this question. This is again assertion and reason type. One second, just. A To screen for ciprofloxacin resistance in Salmonella species, p 5 microgram disc can be used. That is the first sentence. Here it is resistance in Salmonella species. Reason is test with ciprofloxacin 5 microgram will not reliably detect low level resistance in Salmonella species. Sixty plus response is there. So, what is the answer here? The answer is assertion is true, and reason is a correct explanation for the assertion. So, we'll see that here. Test with ciprofloxacin five microgram disc will not reliably detect low level resistance in Salmonella species. To screen for ciprofloxacin resistance in Salmonella species. P fluxacin 5 microgram disc is recommended and also there is uh, one more thing that P fluxacin will not detect resistance due to these, this particular mechanism of fluoroquinolone resistance. Okay. So this ciprofloxacin 5 microgram, uh, how many of you use ciprofloxacin disc? P fluxacin, any of you are using? No. Sir is using. No. You use this? Okay. Next question, next is about Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. So please answer this question. This is again assertion and reason type. Testing of repeat isolate of Pseudomonas may be warranted. This is made Pseudomonas may be warranted. Reason is Pseudomonas aeruginosa may develop resistance during prolonged therapy with all antimicrobial agents. Therefore, isolates that are initially susceptible may become resistance within 3 to 4 days after initiation of therapy whether assertion and reason, what is the interpretation among these four options. Answer is two. This is the correct explanation for assertion. So once the treatment is started, it is advisable to do the repeat testing after 72 hours because the sensitivity pattern might vary. Uh, so this can be added for the other organisms also, sir, so that the repeat testing of AST can be done after what point of time? Usually we, we follow a dictum that, that uh, once you have got a positive report, after that uh, you start a therapy, do not repeat the specimen in less than 72 hours, because even your treatment will take time for response. But still, uh, we do not get that much of uh, cooperation, because uh, in some of the units, they say it's in our protocol, that uh, till the patient has, say, in, in case of a transplant, post-transplant patient, till the fever goes, we'll send the sample every day. But when we get repeat samples, and the sample has been collected within 48 hours, in less than 72 hours, we usually do not carry out a repeat susceptibility test. But whenever it is more than 72 hours or more, then we do uh, subject it to repeat susceptibility testing, because in many situations, uh, the, the susceptibility may go down uh, with increased exposure to the drug. So this example, the question was about Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is also applicable for fluoroquinolone. When the patient is on fluoroquinolones and vancomycin for staph aureus also, the susceptibility report can vary. So the repeat testing has to be performed after 72 hours. So sir, then this particular statement is not uh, limited to Pseudomonas. It, it is, it is, it's, it is it's, in general. It's most aptly said about Pseudomonas, but it can happen at other places also. I, I mean, just as a, uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, I want to go away from it in a lighter vein. You know, in 1988 or 89, in Annals of Internal Medicine, there was an editorial. The editor wrote that if there is a nuclear holocaust, it, uh, killing all the living forms from Earth, two species will survive. One is Pseudomonas aeruginosa because of its high adaptability to any situation. Second is cockroach because nobody can really <laughs> eradicate them. <laughs> Next is about briefly about Stenotrophomonas maltophila. Yes, sir. Just a practical point on last time. We used to take these antibiotics, especially from the general market, it's taken 40 years for us to actually start being able to use So, which of these antibiotics is going to be used in the Middle East and which of these antibiotics are going to be given to the Middle East? The last two examples we saw for this was the treatment for the second time we couldn't be used. And then in the general market, we recommend it to take out 30, 40 years. So, for Pakistan, against the staff all this, it's only about one year. Velcomycin against staff all this, about 30 years. So, again, we know that we are talking about the drugs and the drugs coming in. So, the behavior that is done, we need to work out the antibiotic, which has the right to use and just treat you. And the, the, the antibiotic is going to give you this year rather than two years. And this actually comes back to the question of when you should use the sample. First, you have the quality. I was, I was expecting that somebody will raise that topic. Why don't we use nalidixic acid resistance as a surrogate marker for fluoroquinolone resistance anymore? Is nalidixic acid resistance a surrogate marker of fluoroquinolone resistance? No. Nalidixic acid susceptibility is a surrogate marker of fluoroquinolone susceptibility. Nalidixic acid resistance actually tells us go for MIC testing. So, I mean, the predictable, predict, uh, predictability value of nalidixic acid is so poor that it, it has been removed. Next is about Stenotrophomonas maltophila. So, which of the following is not a CLSI approved drug for testing for Stenotrophomonas? So next question, which of the following does not have a CLSI distribution breakpoint for stenotrophomonas? for ceftazidim. So what does the table show? These are the drugs which the CLSI gives for testing for stenotrophomonas. What is the reason for the first answer? Meropenem, why is it not given? Intrinsically resistant. So for ceftazidim, distribution breakpoints are not available, only MIC breakpoints are available. For minocycline, levofloxacin and cotrimoxazole, distribution breakpoints are available. Next is about briefly about Burkholderia sepatia complex. So, which of the following does not have CLSI distribution breakpoint for Burkholderia?
answer is levofloxacin. You can see in this picture, levofloxacin does not have a distribution breakpoint, only MIC interpretation criteria is available. So these are the drugs which CLSI recommends for testing for Burkholderia. Most commonly what we use for testing, what we test is ceftazidim, meropenem, minocycline, levofloxacin, cotrimoxazole. This is what is a panel. Next coming to gram positive organisms, Staphylococcus. So answer this question, which of the following methods can detect oxacillin resistance in all Staphylococcus species? All, here the crunch is all. Two thousand nineteen CLSI. What is the answer? It is oxacillin. MIC can detect oxacillin resistance in all Staphylococcus species. I will show you a table where this will concept will become very clear. Before this, please answer this question. Which I, of the I warned you earlier that as we go to the Staphylococcus, the water is going to get muddier. <laughs> This is the next question. Which of the following oxacillin resistance detection method is recommended only for Staph aureus, not for other Staphylococcus species? Not, uh, one second, I will re-pull. Huh. Yeah, now it will work. So what is the answer here? Answer is oxacillin salt screen agar. So there is a table which is included in CLSI 2019. This gives the acceptable methods for detecting, detecting resistance for all these Staphylococcus species. So uh, you can see these are the methods here mentioned, that is cefoxetin MIC, cefoxetin distribution, oxacillin MIC, oxacillin distribution and oxacillin salt agar. For cefoxetin MIC can be used in Staph aureus and, Staph aureus and lugdinensis, not for other Staphylococcus species other than aureus and lugdinensis. Cefoxetin distribution cannot be used for pseudo intermediate essentially fairy. Oxacillin MIC can be used to detect resistance in all these Staphylococcus species. Oxacillin distribution can be used for epidermidis, pseudo intermediate and schlieferi. Oxacillin salt agar can be used only to detect resistance in Staph aureus. So you want to add uh, uh, I had one uh, question. I am curious. How many of you, of you speciate coagulase negative Staph? <laughs> I mean, we are talking at a level, but before that, let me know how many of you speciate coagulase negative staph. Sir, sir, and because sir, why, why, why I ask this question is, uh, I know that majority of us, we do not bother to speciate sta uh, coagulase negative staph. And we have a belief that majority of the coagulase negative staph is epidermidis. And that's why epidermidis, the name comes quite high up and people who have been speciating particularly using latest technologies like Malditoff, epidermidis is not the most commonly isolated uh, coagulase negative for staff. us it is hemolytic. hominis hemolyticus they are far above epidermidis epidermidis is much below in the list so at the, now this actually shows us the importance of speciating coagulase negative staff So, uh, answer this question, what is a vancomycin susceptibility breakpoint for staph aureus and cons, whether it is same or it is different? I'll skip this. Okay, so what is the answer here? It is 
2 microgram per ml for staph aureus and for cons it is 4. You can see in this table for vancomycin staph aureus only it is less than or equal to 2 is sensitive, more than or equal to 16 is resistant. For other than staph aureus it is less than or equal to 4 is sensitive, more than or equal to 32 is resistant. So next coming to a note which is given in UCAST. So there is no concept of GSA that is glycopeptide intermediate uh, resistant staph aureus in UCAST. Any of you have gone through and uh, seen why is it not included in UCAST? This is the reason they give. There is no GSA in UCAST as increased dose does not work clinically for serious infection. So there is no breakpoint for, there is no categorization of G sign mentioned in UCAST. So this is the explanation they have given. You can see here vancomycin, it is more th less than or equal to 2 is sensitive, anything more than 2 is resistant. There is no intermediate range at all in uh, for vancomycin. So also uh, in UCAST, I means increased dose, they have, uh, they have fixed uh, they have fixed approved dose for all I, okay. Uh, wherever it is not available, they have not uh, used that word I. Next coming to, why we do not do distribution for vancomycin in staph aureus because it does not differentiate VSSA from VSA and uh, does not differentiate among VS cons, VI cons and VR cons. This is the reason why we do not do distribution for vancomycin. And vanco screen agar can be done for staph aureus with vancomycin, with vancomycin MIC4 may, may not grow. So that is the point you should take if you are using vancomycin screen agar and MIC is ideal for vancomycin testing for staph aureus. VSSA can turn into VSA during the course of prolonged therapy. So repeat testing after 72 hours is recommended when the patient is on vancomycin for prolonged duration. Yes sir. So one question sir, have you come Oxygen is So any value, if vancomycin MIC is more than uh, more than 8 for staph aureus or more than or equal to 32 for cons has to be sent to the reference laboratory. Next a brief note on inducible clindamycin resistance. So if erythromycin disc is adjacent the, to the clindamycin, we see something called as D phenomenon which is depicted here. So report clindamycin as resistant because constitutive resistance may develop during the therapy. But there is also note that clindamycin can still be used for short term therapy because constitutive resistance is very unlikely to develop. This is about inducible clindamycin resistance. Wait, wait, wait. Any doubt? Sorry? Duration of short term. Difficult to say how much is short term here. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, clindamycin is a protein. Switch over to, I mean, what, because it's a protein synthesis inhibitor, so toxin production inhibition will be enough. 72 hours therapy or 96 hours therapy will be enough, and then switch over to something else. Truly speaking, for some of the drug bug combinations people have worked out. For example, you know that for chemo prophylaxis of meningococcus, at one time we used to give five days therapy. And then they found that rapid uh, 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 emergence of resistance is taking place, so they ultimately cut it down to three days nowadays, chemo prophylaxis. So, for uh, say, mupirocin for Staphylococcus aureus ir nasal eradication. They always recommend that apply it for five days, and after that stop for seven days. If you want, you can repeat again for five days, but do not continue for more than five days. So for certain drug bug combinations, specific people, they have, a, depending on their experience, they have a limit. But for all of them, it has not been done. But as he has rightly said, we take it as up to five days. May not be enough exposure for emergence of resistance. No, uh, that is that is always there. Azithromycin has some amount of uh, immunomodulatory effect also. It, it, it people have shown its activity against in animal models against Pseudomonas UTI, and yeah, and, yeah, that kind of effect can also be there. But Azithro has been shown in certain situations to have immunomodulatory effect also. Next is a note on linozolid when we are testing for staph aureus. So organism with resistant results by distribution should not be reported resistant directly. It should be confirmed by MIC method. And if it is sensitive to linozolid, it should be reported susceptible to even tedizolid. Next coming to enterococcus. So please answer this question. Which of the following cephalosporins can be used for treatment of enterococcal infection? Please use your clickers, not mouth. Okay. My God. <laughs> so what is the answer here? It is ceftriaxone. There are conditions where it is used for treatment. So let us see the table. I'll show you the table. But before this, answer this question. Synergism is exhibited by all of the following combinations except which one? HLG is high level gentamicin. So what is the answer here? It is HLG resistant, ampicillin sensitive. Whenever high level uh, amino glycoside is resistant, the synergism uh, doesn't work. So you can see this table here. Very so important table. Please have a look properly. So this, this column tells the high level amino glycoside, that is HLG or HLS breakpoint. So if HLG is sensitive, 
you have a cell wall acting agent that is either penicillin, ampicillin or vancomycin sensitive synergism is seen. Whereas if your high level aminoglycoside is resistant, irrespective of this is sensitive or not, the synergism doesn't work. So uh, here what is the note given here is if it is sensitive, sensitive to uh, high level amino glycoside and sensitive to cell wall acting agent, this is the dose given. That is you give penicillin or ampicillin with gentamicin. Second is if this high level amino glycoside is resistant, you have a cell wall acting agent which is sensitive. The choice is, the, cho the drug of choice that time is ampicillin plus ceftriaxone. This is one indication where you can use ceftriaxone for treatment of enterococcal infection. In serious enterococcal infection, when you have high level amino glycoside resistance, if your cell wall acting agent is sensitive, ampicillin plus ceftriaxone can be used for treatment. Next is, if your high level amino glycoside is sensitive and you have a low level resistance in penicillin or ampicillin, the, the dose, uh, the choice will be ampicillin or penicillin with gentamicin. Here what we do is high level of, high dose of ampicillin or penicillin is used. Okay? When you have high level amino glycoside sensitive, low level resistance is seen in the cell wall acting agent, you can give high level, high dose of cell wall acting agent along with the high level amino glycoside. Is this clear? If it is high level resistance, we do not use cell wall acting agent for treatment. That time the choice will be vancomycin plus gentamicin. If vancomycin is resistant, then the treatment choice will be daptomycin, quinupristin, dalfopristin and linozolid. Should I explain this again? Or Are you, sir? yeah, okay. So, should I, okay. So, if you have, is this first, first one clear? If high level amino glycoside is sensitive, cell wall acting agent is sensitive, synergism will work. That time drug of choice will be one of the cell wall acting agent with amino glycoside. Yes? Second one, if your high level amino glycoside is resistant, the synergism will not work. So that time the choice will be cell wall acting agent plus ceftriaxone. This is one indication where ceftriaxone is used for treatment of enterococcal infections. If you see, uh, if you have sensitive for high level amino glycoside, you have low level resistance. Low level resistance is clearly defined through MIC breakpoint. If low level resistance is seen in cell wall active agent, you can choose to give higher dose of cell wall acting agent along with amino glycoside. Whereas if you see high level resistance, you do not choose cell wall acting agent for treatment. Instead, you go for vancomycin. Vanco vancomycin plus amino glycoside is given. Is it clear now? Yes? Yeah, dose is correct. This one? Okay, anyways, I will, we will cross-check. Maybe we'll the cross clinicians check. can answer. Uh, Sir? We can cross-check and let you. Yeah. This is a sentence Numerical taken from. Yeah. Yeah. Numericals, maybe some uh, variations will be there. We will cross-check and, and we'll tell you. Okay? Just one point I want to uh, stress on that. We are talking about a possible synergism in vivo by testing for high-level gentamicin resistance in vitro. So that, that must be very clearly understood here. So this is a kind of a surrogate test to predict whether we expect in vivo synergism between the two drugs or not. This is a standard reference from Harrison, sir. Sorry. No, this No, CLSA, uh, can you just read the sentence if you have with you?
Next coming to this question, all of the following statements regarding susceptibility testing for ampicillin and penicillin against enterococci are true except. So what is the answer here? <laughs> the answer is susceptible, except this is the this is wrong statement. Susceptible to ampicillin indicates susceptible to penicillin. That is the wrong statement. If it is sensitive to penicillin, you can tell it is sensitive to ampicillin. Whereas the other way around, you cannot tell. So this is the explanation. Enterococci susceptible to penicillin are susceptible to ampicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, amoxicillin clavulinate, piperacillin tazobactam for non beta lactamase producing enterococci. However, enterococci is susceptible to ampicillin cannot be assumed to be susceptible to penicillin. If penicillin results are needed, you have to test penicillin separately. Okay? Ampicillin susceptibility test again can be extrapolated to amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulinate, clavulinate ampicillin and piptas. Okay? So this is for penicillin and this is for ampicillin. If you test sensitive to penicillin, so then your report should include that sensitive to penicillin also indicates that it is sensitive to ampicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, amoxiclav and piptas. If it is sensitive to ampicillin, it is sensitive to amoxiclav, amoxicillin, ampicillin and piptas. Okay. So next question, if, if any enterococcus isolate is shown to be HLG resistant, then the isolate is which of the following options are correct. Yeah, the answer is high level resistance Good. to gentamicin and other aminoglycoside except septomycin which has to be tested separately. You cannot equate HLG and HLS. So next coming to next organism that is streptococcus pneumoniae. So what is the MIC breakpoint for penicillin sensitive in streptococcus pneumoniae in meningitis isolates? It is less than or equal to 0 0.06 is the answer for this is the penicillin breakpoint sensitive breakpoint for breakpoint for meningitis isolates. Next question: What is the ceftriaxone breakpoint in meningitis isolates of Streptococcus pneumoniae? Question is different, okay.
yeah actually uh, as as i as i told earlier that this to remember is humanly are not possible but there are few things which is expected out of us to remember and uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is one among them so what is the answer here it is 0.5 so uh, after this i'll show you a table of breakpoint for streptococcus pneumoniae which of the following here are wrong so all of the following statements regarding antibiotic susceptibility for streptococcus pneumoniae are correct except So what is the answer here? This is the answer. Okay. So other answers are correct. CSF isolates against vancomycin can be tested by both disdiffusion and MIC. This is a correct statement. For non-CSF isolates with oxacillin zone less than or equal to 19 mm, do not report as penicillin resistant without performing a penicillin MIC test. This is also a correct statement. So what is the disk strength for oxacillin used here? for streptococcus pneumonia one microgram oxacillin test so for meningitis isolate what is recommended mic is to be done for all meningitis isolate of streptococcus pneumonia we will do mic for which all drugs ceftriaxone cefotaxime meropenem these are the drugs and for vancomycin you can do disdiffusion for non meningitis isolate so what is the protocol you you test with one microgram oxacillin if it is more than 20 more than or equal to 20 mm you can report it as sensitive if it is less than or equal to 19 mm you cannot report as resistant you have to perform mic test okay if it is 20 and more you can report it as sensitive if it is sensitive less than sensitive to uh, sensitive to oxacillin it indicates that it is sensitive to ceftriaxone cefotaxime meropenem these are the drugs it is sensitive to if it is resistant you have to repeat you have to do the individual antibiotic mic test so i'll show you the explanation i'll just show the explanation then we'll come to the question so streptococcus pneumonia this is one more point Uh, after this there is a table for other beta lactam agent streptococcus pneumonia isolate susceptible to levofloxacin or susceptible to gemifloxacin and moxifloxacin and vice versa and also streptococcus pneumonia susceptible to gemifloxacin and moxi cannot be assumed to be susceptible to levofloxacin it has to be tested separately so this is the table penicillin disdiffusion 1 microgram oxacillin is used if it is a non meningitis isolate and if the zone diameter is more than or equal to 20 mm you report it as sensitive if it is less than or equal to 19 mm test for penicillin cefotaxime ceftriaxone or meropenem mic okay in meningitis isolate we go for mic directly and also here the dose is mentioned if it is if the sensitive breakpoint is less than or equal to 0.06 more than or equal to 0.12 is resistant the dose is 3 million units at 4 hourly is given for csf isolate report only the meningitis interpretation based on only meningitis breakpoints you have to report for meningitis isolate for non meningitis isolates the breakpoint is less than or equal to 2 for penicillin more than or equal to 8 is resistant for non csf isolate both meningitis and non meningitis interpretation has to be added in the clinical reporting why hmm tell why yeah we don't know that the meningitis uh, may be there or may not be there okay so this is uh, particularly important for blood
This is about the penicillin. For ceftriaxone, the breakpoint for meningitis is less than or equal to 0.5. More than or equal to 2 is resistant. For CSF isolate, report only meningitis interpretation. This holds good for both penicillin and ceftriaxone. For non-meningitis isolate, it is less than or equal to 1 and more than or equal to 4 sensitive and resistant breakpoints. For non-CSF isolate, interpretation for both meningitis and non-meningitis has to be added. For vancomycin, disc diffusion can also be done or MIC can be done for both meningitis and non-meningitis isolates. This is a note about AST, the susceptibility testing in pneumococci. So, this is one of the classical examples that though MIC to a particular drug is a constitutional property of an isolate, but the interpretation is site dependent. So, I mean, it's not that in a patient who has got streptococcus pneumonia isolated from blood and isolated from CSF, they are not two different clones. It's the same clone which has a specific MIC that won't be different in the two isolates, but the cri criteria for reporting will, de will depend on from where it has been isolated because that is dependent on PKPD of the drug at that particular site. Next is a table which is given in UCAST. So you all want to get confused with the uh, interpretation of streptococcus pneumonia or we'll skip this. It is are you slightly, already confused or you are okay? <laughs> if you are okay then... So you, uh, most of us follow CLSI guidelines, right? You want me to repeat for CLSI streptococcus pneumonia? Yes? Okay, so what is for meningitis isolates, what we are supposed to do? We are supposed to test MIC. There is no distribution should not be done. I am telling CLSI, not you cast. CLSI. So, for meningitis isolates, MIC interpretation has to be done. You test MIC for penicillin, ceftriaxone, cefotaxim, meropenem. If it is sensitive, report as sense. These are the breakpoints. For non-meningitis isolates, 1 microgram oxacillin is used as a surrogate marker. If it, is, if it is more than or equal to 20, you report it as sensitive to penicillin, ceftriaxone, cefotaxim and meropenem. If it is less than or equal to 19, repeat, you have to do MIC test for the individual antibiotic and report as per the breakpoints. Clear now? Okay. So, I will skip this table because it's, it, you may get confused with this. So, next coming to, these are all easy question, intrinsic resistance. The protea tribe are intrinsically resistant to all except. Most of you have got it correct, ampicelbactam. So, you know that in CLSI at the end, end pages there is a table showing clear picture of what is a intrinsic resistance. So, this is the organism list and these are the antibiotics. You can get this, these are the R means intrinsic resistance in this table. This table is available for Enterobacteriaceae, non fermenters and Enterococcus. Even, uh, enterococcus, even for Staphylococcus this table is there. So, I will you not You have seen these tables? Okay. So, the salmonella are intrinsically resistant to all except. Hundred percent can we have? So, the answer is cotrimoxazole. So, Salmonella, Shigella, these are all the, uh, it's re intrinsically resistant to first and second generation cephalosporins, aminoglycosides and cephamycins. And after the pediatrician, the
You have a right to refuse. Next question. Stenotrophomonas maltophilia is intrinsically resistant to all the following except. Hundred percent? Yeah, answer is cotrimoxazole. So this is the table list for non-fermenters which is given. These are the drug bug combination. R is intrinsic resistance. Till the time uh, things are set there, I want to pose a very simple question. How does buller hintenegger differ from Neutrintegger? <laughs> I mean, we, we have taken muller hintenegger as the ultimate in antibiotic susceptibility testing, whether broth or agar. So what it has extra or what it has less than, say, ordinary nutrient agar or nutrient broth? Okay, it's free from folates. Okay, it, uh, I mean, it does not have thymidine and thymine. So that's one of the things. But constituent-wise, what does it have additional or what does it, doesn't, it doesn't have it contains starch, okay, acid hydrolysis of starch. So on one hand, it has extra substances which makes most of the commonly isolated organisms grow on it. It has casein, acid hydrolysis of casein. It also has acid hydrolysis of starch. So one question I will ask is why, why didn't uh, they give dextrose instead of starch? I mean, I feel that, okay, very right. So if you give dextrose, which is very easily metabolized by most of the organisms, it will, so fast uh, metabolism of dextrose would have reduced the pH and created a problem there. So that's why they have given starch, which is a very slowly acted on by organisms thereby, and that is probably one of the reasons that all our readings are usually within 24 hours. We do not interpret any of the things beyond 24 hours when the I mean, physical parameters may not be conducive for antibiotic susceptibility testing. So I mean, I wanted to clear out that thing, that muller hinton agar is slightly more nutritious. It has beef extract, beef infusion. In addition, it has uh, acid hydrolysis of casein and acid hydrolysis of starch. It, this, this was actually formulated by Muller and Hinton, not for antibiotic susceptibility testing. <laughs> they wanted to make a medium, serum-free medium, to grow Neisseria meningitis and uh, Neisseria uh, gonorrhea. But then uh, there were far better media which came out for Neisseria species, and they found that this medium is much more suited for susceptibility testing than the original purpose for which it was formulated. <laughs> Next question. The following is intrinsically resistant to E. fecalis, but not to E. fecium, Enterococcus fecium. So what is the answer here? Hmm. 
Mm, go ahead. Yeah, the answer Very is quinupristin, dalfopristin. This is intrinsically resistant to fecalis, but not enterococcus fecium. So no, this no one complained about the uh, stem framing. <laughs> because antibiotics are not resistant. <laughs> Organisms are resistant. Anyway, you all understood what she meant. <laughs> Next, coming to a brief note on hospital antibiogram. So, what is, the, what is an antibiogram? An antibiogram is an overall profile of antimicrobial susceptibility testing result of a specific microorganism to a battery of antimicrobial agent. This is what is a antibiogram. So, what are the different types of antibiogram? So, the most commonly used one is cumulative antibiogram. So, what is cumulative antibiogram? Here, the susceptibility profile is generated by the laboratory by using aggregate susceptibility data from the hospital. So, how does the cumulative antibiogram look? This is the picture showing cumulative antibiogram. This is the organism and this is the antibiotic for which you are, uh, we are calculating the susceptibility percentage. This is how a cumulative antibiogram will look. And so, sir, the uh, here I want to add something. Uh, uh, for UCAS, uh, susceptibility means S plus I. Whereas for uh, CLSI, uh, susceptibility means S and not susceptibility means I plus R. Not so, uh, yeah, uh, not susceptible. So, when we have inter-hospital uh, comparison where they use two different uh, guidelines, uh, it, it, may pose a, it may pose a problem. Yeah, I mean, if you have to compare, then you have to compare using the same, same methodology. Uh, we cannot compare apples and oranges. The isolate with intermediate susceptibility should be excluded and the data, this, this ant cumulative antibiogram should be circulated at least once in a year. Next type of antibiogram is enhanced antibiogram. This is, the pattern is similar to the cumulative antibiogram, but the calculation, it is stratified based on various parameters like patient location, department wise, age group wise, site specific infection wise, patient comorbidities or acquisition in the community versus healthcare, like that the, it is stratified based on various parameters. This is what is enhanced antibiogram, but the structure is similar to cumulative antibiogram. Third type of antibiogram is called a subtraction antibiogram. Here, the current the current year antibiogram is is compared with the last year or previous year antibiogram, and the susceptibility percentage of drug bug combination of past year antibiogram is subtracted from the susceptibility of present year, and the ex and you express in terms of subtraction. This is a picture showing subtraction antibiogram. Is it clear? The picture so, is clear. Here, what, what, what is the basis for the subtraction antibiogram is the present year antibiogram is compared to last year antibiogram and you express the susceptibility in terms of uh, subtraction. So, here you can see the blue color is decrease in more than or equal to 10 percent. If it is highlighted in this is gray color, very light gray, this is, uh, if it is increase in more than or 10 can be highlighted like this. Such kind of antibiogram is used for assessing the outcome of antimicrobial stewardship. If it, uh, you want to assess the change in the change in trend of antimicrobial resistance, the preferred antibiogram is subtraction antibiogram. So, what are the rules for constructing an antibiogram? So, minimum number of isolate, at least 30 isolate should be available for each organism for meaningful statistical analysis. First, uh, only the first isolate per patient for any specimen type, uh, specimen type is considered for analysis. Routine drugs, only results of antimicrobial drugs that are routinely tested and clinically useful should be presented to the clinicians. Antibiogram should be repeated at least annually or if the number of isolate is more, then can, it can be done more frequently. To exclude non-clinical isolate, we should not include isolates from the surveillance cultures or colonizers or environmental sampling. These isolates should be excluded. Antibiogram should contain only the clinical isolates. So, this is the 
important. Uh, two points I'll mention here. Uh, as he has rightly said, that when you have repeated isolate from the same source of the same patient, uh, then we take only the first isolate. Similarly, if you have a, a proven outbreak, the outbreak strains should be excluded because it can, it can skew your data, particularly for situations like, suppose, neonatal ICU, the total number of isolates in a year, if you have six beds, will be somewhere around, say, between 25 and 30, out of which 10 may be an acinetobacter bomb, any outbreak isolates. So it skews the things. And secondly, all antibiotic biograms should be presented as suscept number susceptible rather than number resistant because uh, we always have a tendency to show whatever uh, scares people more. So the universal convention is to represent it as, as susceptible rather than resistant. May I add something? Yes. Can you go back to your substantial antibiotic? Yeah, so uh, this is one antibiotic and the one that he showed earlier. I would talk about the cosmetic appearance of the antibiotic. Like in the previous one, you had not clubbed together the penicillin groups or the myelinators like groups. So it's on one axis, you club together all the groups together, and one side you club the family together. Enterobacteriaceae, you know, so that looks yeah. better. Yeah. Like over here, it is uh, arranged alphabetically, acetobacter, citrobacter, and all those things. Yeah, yeah. If you arrange it as per family, enterobacteriaceae or trichrophy, so that you can see better. Uh, Next, coming to direct susceptibility testing from blood culture. So this is the uh, IDSA recommendation that also emphasizes on doing anti direct antimicrobial susceptibility testing from blood culture samples for better clinical outcome. So this is the CLSI study published in JCM in 2018. This was a study from the direct blood culture uh, broth. They used two different type of blood culture bottles and they have, uh, they have evaluated various errors which are encountered and they have uh, told that this is the report. That is direct dif disc diffusion versus reference disc diffusion. Direct disc diffusion is done, that is the one which is done from the blood culture broth. Reference disc diffusion is the one which is done from the colony 0.5 mcfillens. So here the, rep the results of this tests are categorical agreement was of 87.9%, very major error was 0.5%, major error is 3.5%, minor error is 10%. This is an ongoing study. This present study was done mainly on gram negative isolate and they have told that this is an acceptable error. This can be safely implemented in the clinical laboratory. So this is... Uh, is it clear at the end? So this is the this is the procedure they have mentioned in the CLSI study. So this is the most commonly followed method that is four drops of blood culture broth directly onto the distribution plates and it is read at six hours. You incubate the plate after the uh, broth is inoculated on the MHA plate. Uh, after inoculating the disc, you incubate for six hours. You take reading at six hours and further incubate and take reading at 18 hours. This is the most commonly used procedure. So uh, this direct, uh, direct from blood culture distribution tests are, are read at 8 to 10 hours, performs at or above CLSI standards as compared to standard distribution and to reference, reference uh, broad dilution technique. So this tells that this can be employed in the clinical reporting. Direct from blood culture, uh, direct from blood culture distribution test read at 16 to 18 hours perform at or above the CLSI standard. So the reading taken at 6 hours, 8 to 10 hours and at 16 to 18 hours are reliable and it has a categorical agreement of more than 89.9, very major error, error of less than 3 and a very major and major error of less than 3 as compared to standard distribution test. So this study, sir, is explained in the previous session. I'm not going into the detail. So this is the this is the table which UCAST has given under the guideline that is rapid antimicrobial susceptibility testing. So the breakpoints are available for the reading, the rapid AST reading at four hours, six hours, and at uh, four hours, six hours, and at eight hours. 
this is the break point. So, when you are reading the plate at 4 hours, you have to use this break point and at 6 hours this break point and at 8 hours this break point. Say suppose you are not able to take reading because of the faint growth, then you have to leave it blank and add the comment telling that it will be updated at a later time. So, this is the procedure which the is mentioned. The meaning of this is at 4 hour you take the reading, uh, whichever uh, is visible growth is there, uh, uh, you report. If there is no growth is there, you just keep it blank, add a comment that it will be updated later. Again, you take the reading at 6 hours and 8 hours. This is the methodology given in the UCAS regarding the inoculum they have mentioned as 100 to 150 microliter incubation time and they have even given the reading zone diameters. So, this is what the blank comment should be. If you are not able to take the reading, it has to go with this comment telling that it will be updated at a later time, later point of time and it should be mentioned that this is done from the, this is done directly from the positive blood culture broth. Next coming to a very brief note on, this is from one of the article, what are the major difference between UCAST and CLSI guidelines? So, uh, here uh, CLSI FDA plays a main role whereas in UCAST it is mainly the committee, European committee which does this breakpoints. Role of industry in CLSI the pharmaceutical industry play a role in decision process whereas in UCAST the pharmaceutical industry has only the consultative role. The documents are free in UCAST guidelines whereas it is for sale in CLSI. The funding also it industry plays a role in funding and decision making process whereas in UCAS it is completely a government body. Number of meetings also varies and background how exactly the breakpoints are derived are clearly given in UCAS guidelines whereas in CLSI that part of information is not given and also expert rule few are included whereas uh, elaborative expert rule for each of the drug book combination is elaborated in UCAS guidelines. And you, we have already uh, seen this, there is no cascade reporting or selective reporting mentioned clearly in UCAS whereas it is given in CLSI. The breakpoints also varies where here it is I is, uh, in UCAS it is susceptible increased exposure whereas I in CLSI is intermediate. Epidemiological cutoff value the way it is depicted is different. Increased dose concept that is STD is given in CLSI whereas UCAS it is I category that is susceptible increased exposure. The technical error is very clearly mentioned under the name area of te uh, technical uncertainty in UCAS whereas uh, and also troubleshooting is mentioned in UCAS, it is not mentioned in CLSI and again this part was discussed when we discussed antibiogram and breakpoints. Breakpoints we see that uh, UCAS breakpoints are slightly higher compared to CLSI, I will show you the screenshot. And also there is a difference in reporting pattern for pneumococci and also for phosphomycin the breakpoints in CLSI is only for E. coli whereas for Enterobacteriaceae whereas in UCAS it is available in Enterobacteriaceae uh, for other members other than E. coli also for Enterobacteriaceae. You can see this picture here the breakpoints it is not for all the drug bug combination but usually the breakpoints are slightly in the higher range in UCAS compared to CLSI guidelines. Visible. Next, uh, next about the how to go about reporting the MIC guiding table. Which guidelines is giving me the breakpoint zone or MIC for fibrosis or gutum in enterobacteriaceae? It is not. It's not mentioned. You it's not no. mentioned. No. No. How is biomedical reporting it in N two two eighty? We have uh, asked the Biomiro representative, they have told that yeah, you can come here. they have referred it to one of the Japanese article and they, are, they have got the approval for that but they have not produced the document to us. We have asked them to give us the article, they are telling that it is written in Japanese, you will not understand. <laughs> so that is one, that is one common, that is one common entry that is raised by Hassel also. That what Absolutely, Sumit. A point well taken. We also uh, face the same problem. <laughs> C 
Sir, you want to comment on this? Asian countries, whether UCAS is more ap appropriate? don't know about it but uh, nowadays uh, uh, for example the the percentage of people who were following CLSI five years back it's gradually going down and people are more and more taking up you uh, cast guidelines lines nowadays Thank you, sir. So we can uh, we can proceed. Yes. Uh, last few slides are there. Maybe f uh, five ten minute more. Okay, this is one MCQ for you. How, How many, many of, of you? <laughs> How many of you are familiar with this MIC guiding table? How many of you use this for clinical reporting? Excellent. Sumit, so, uh, do you use? Sir, 
Okay, so this. So this is a uh, Vitek MIC guiding table. What uh, uh, what Biomedio gives. So you uh, you answer this, then we will discuss how to interpret. Not working. Can't see. Okay, can't see. I will help you out. Wait. Fine now. Okay, you you did not see the values. Green ones are sensitive. Yellow ones are intermediate. Red ones are uh, sensitive. Uh, are, are resistant. Okay, so these are the drugs. I'll just explain you how this uh, how this is to be used. So these are the drugs. These wh why these are very unevenly distributed wells is in Vitek panel. How many ever dilutions they test? They have plotted here. So in Vitek for ampicillin, there are uh, there are six wells. So there are six numericals here. So six breakpoints they have uh, taken here. So for amoxiclav, again 5. So likewise, how many ever wells are tested for that particular antibiotic that, that has been depicted in this picture? So how do we use it? So this is the template. What you see is the template. This is the template, complete template. This template is available for each of the panel. For 280, a template is available. For 281, for staph and entro template is available for strepto. So, in this template what we are supposed to do is, this black highlighted ones are the MICs of a clinical isolate. When we get a Vitek report, there are MIC of a clinical isolate, you have to mark it on a template. Why this is required? Because, say suppose you have four antibiotics which are sensitive. How many Almost are sensitive here? Count? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so in this six, uh, uh, which one you want to give? Uh, which one you would suggest the clinician to give? Uh, the to choose that particular uh, in the in the sensitive group of antibiotic, which one to choose? That is what is the information given here. So the 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 idea here is, if it is farther from the sensitive range, that is, this is the intermediate range. The more farther it is, the better action will be the drug. So you can see these are the just next to the yellow. If it is if it comes in the next of next to this second row of this, then it is a better drug compared to the first row drug. So the farther from the from the center line, the better action will be the drug. But again, while interpreting this, you have to keep in mind that it has to be chosen for that particular class. You have a meropenem acting better than a third generation cephalosporin, you cannot tell that start giving meropenem. It has to be chosen according to the class of drugs. So say suppose if, uh, if you have a pan resistant isolate, if it is resistant to all the drugs, but still clinician will ask, tell me one drug which might act so the the it is it is quite it is exactly opposite here nearer to the center one is a better acting drug that can be chosen as a last resort so for sensitive it should be farther from the yellow zone towards the green zone whereas for resistant isolate it has to be nearer to the yellow zone that maybe is our clinicians uh, dr venkat and others our clinic uh, it will be useful to you when you will interpret it so this is how we use the MIC guiding table. You have to take the template, plot the clinical isolates and see which one is a better drug that can be added in the comment along with the template. Understood everyone? Is there sufficient evidence to uh, You want to add that? something? Uh, you please come forward. Dr. He Sumit has something to say. Yeah, no, what I was asking, yeah. Thank you. 
That will also depend on whether we are dealing with a time-dependent or a concentration-dependent antibiotic. So there are too many, too many variables, too many confounders. Akash, give your mic to answer. Protein binding also. Protein binding also. So he is Mr. Ansul from Biomedo. He 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 wants to add uh, a few more points. Please. So I think already uh, Madam and Sir and Dr. Salaf sir has already uh, told. So you know one very simple thing of bringing this chart was like uh, we used we used to give MICs in the vital report, but the issue was that how to make the maximum use of that MIC will this was the challenge. So as you know, Madam has already explained, the first and the most important thing about the chart is the identification. You need to get the identification right, and these charts depend on. For enterobacteriaceae, there is one chart with impurity. For non, for non enterobacteriaceae there is another chart. So identification is the first thing. Then which type of card you are using, that is the second thing which you have to take care. And the simple concept on which you know this thing is based is called as the therapeutic index concept. So the therapeutic index is a very very simple formula that is breakpoint. That is the sensitive breakpoint divided by observed MIC. That is the formula which is used because again, if you have multiple sensitive choices and if you want to use that, you know which is a better choice, exclusively based on the MIC. Because you know, as the microbiologist, we may not have the patient in front of us, and there are different kind of conditions which the patient may have, depending upon you know the void volume, depending upon the weight, depending upon so many other characteristics. But you know, as Vitek is an in vitro diagnostic system, this is an in vitro report, and based on the product which we are getting from the system, that is MIC. And on the basis of MIC, how can we say that which can work? And as Madam has very nicely pointed out, because you know the thing is like if you have three or four sensitive drugs, very rarely a, you know that will be a question for the clinician like you know which one to choose. But the thing is when you don't have any sensitive option, or the sensitive option is not viable, for example, you know it cannot be administered to the patient. In that case, the resistance becomes the core, and there are publications which say. That in case, for example, neuropenem, if your neuropenem MIC is exceeds 16, that is, that means if there are 16 and above, and that is in the range of 32, so even when you go for a combination therapy, the likelihood of working are very, very low. So uh, this chart is becomes very, very useful. Now the three things which you have to take care of is first is the name of the organism, that is whether it is for enterobacteriaceae, non enterobacteriaceae, which type of card you are using. On the, uh, on the left hand uh, left column, there are the antibiotics which are there in the Vitek card. And this is the complete range of MICs which are covered. SI and R are the current breakpoints. So the chart which is shown, that is 2018 breakpoints. 2019 will be printed and that will be circulated with a like, second report match which will happen. And how to read it, again, Ma'am has already told. So sensitive, the one, you know, the biggest misconception, uh, the biggest misconception was that lowest MIC is the best MIC. But you know, now when you apply the therapeutic index formula, so that makes a better sense. That is, lowest MIC compared to the therapeutic breakpoint is the better MIC exclusively on the basis. And to add what Dr. Pallav has already explained, based on whether the drug is a time dependent or a concentration dependent or a time and concentration dependent, where you AUC by MIC, Pmax by MIC, T by MIC, there are a few areas where it has already been worked out, even within the sensitive category. For example, in case of infective endocarditis, uh, the viridan streptococci, the MIC, the lower the MIC, the shorter you can, you can have the duration of therapy. There are many publications which show that if the MIC is very low, then the, the duration can be shorter. 
people have worked on in osteomyelitis in some of the papers. So in others, it is probably a, a, a good edu uh, educated guess yet to be proven. Uh, I mean, in that situation, truly speaking, we can prepare something like this even with disc diffusion diameters. The, the gap between the cutoff, between the breakpoint diameter and the actual diameter, how much bigger it is, whether that is better predictive of clinical response. So something like that can be there, but that will be much less accurate as compared to MIC values. Yeah, that is correct. This is the limited option what we have. Uh, beyond that, we don't have, uh, we don't have anything. Ansul, uh, 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 you agree with this? And answer, answer, you are also coming up with the card uh, which has uh, a more number of wells. No, no, number of wells per antibiotic. Yes, sir. Number of wells will also be more. Again, one logic, very small thing to talk about that is that previously, if you see, the intermediate window used to be very, very big. For example, you know, the sensitive breakpoint is 2, intermediate breakpoint used to be 4 to 8, and resistance used to be 16. So, for an antibiotic and drug combination, 
to have such big variations, to have MIC2 and MIC16 used to be very, very big. And the chances of getting major errors used to be very, very low. But now as the drug resistance is increasing and the breakpoints are shrinking, so you have the breakpoints as 1, 2 and 4, 0.5, 1 and 2. So the chances of getting major errors are much, much higher. That's why you see in Vitex, previously the average number of wells which used to be there for antibiotic used to be 3 to 4, but now the average number is about 4 to 6 and the majority would be having about 4 wells minimum and sometimes say in Lancomycin there are about 7 wells which are there. So you are coming up with a card with, uh, uh, with more number of wells? Yes, 104 wells and more number At the same cost, right? <laughs> 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 okay, okay. So, uh, 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 thanks a lot, Ansul. Uh, very nicely you have highlighted. Sir, uh, this is the last part of the session. So right. I'll, yeah. I'll just say one thing about it. That, uh, Harshul, you don't have to feel bad about the comment that it doesn't give the, give the actual MIC. It gives a virtual MIC, definitely. It, uh, on many occasions, doesn't give you the exact figure. It says uh, more than this and less than this. So, we don't know how much less than or how much more than that. So, some... All the systems, they have some kind of a virtuality. Uh, isn't a CLSI or you cast a virtual method? Uh, who told that in our body the organism is in the concentration of 1.5 <laughs> into 10 well raised to the power 8 <laughs> per milliliter or per gram of tissue? So who said that muller hinton agar is the most, uh, I mean, closely resembling to body tissues? There are studies which have shown that DMEM is a much better medium than this. <laughs> and then we have so many additional things. So, yes. But that doesn't mean that CLSI UCAS doesn't work. That is because it has been tested over decades and decades with outcome studies and it has been fine-tuned. And this is also in the process of fine-tuning and we also, there are limitations. We want convenience with, uh, I mean, best possible answers. So I have a question now. Uh, why did the uh, Thank you, sir. Sir, we'll go ahead. This uh, last part of the presentation, what are the uh, details we should include in a culture report? So, turnaround time, direct AST report with appropriate comments.
any AST if there is any change from the direct AST report, direct distribution to the reference of the colony AST, it has to be highlighted and alerted to the clinician. Organism pathogenicity related comments like it was discussed in the previous session, especially for pathogenicity uncertain organisms, the comment has to be mentioned. Intrinsic resistance note is very, very important that has to be mentioned. MIC guiding table depicting therapeutic include, uh, index can be included. Antibiotic predicting susceptibility to other agents that has to be included in the report, dosage on which breakpoints are established, especially in SDD when you are interpreting on susceptible dose dependent, this also can be included, infection control advice, specific antibiotic resistance mechanism related comment like in inducible clindamycin resistance MRSA, a note has to be added. Site specific antibiotic related comments, what should not be used should also be included in the culture report. So this is the question in front of all of us. And let us give a big hand to Dr. Rajasri and Dr. Apurva Shastri for making the whole thing It was a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Sir, actually the, uh, the truth is we were, uh, we were very much tense two weeks back. Uh, we, I mean, th uh, this is something which, uh, 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 which is beyond uh, our, uh, I mean, CLSA and UCAS, we always find uh, 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 so much of difficulty, right? So uh, Dipasri has not slept for last two weeks. So that much of effort she has put. Yeah. I request uh, Dr. Damani, sir, to give a moment to uh, to Dr. Pallav Rai. Please come up, sir. 